So this, this, I'm sort of basing this off of a, uh, oh, it's complaining about something, off of a blog post that we put on our, I don't know how many of you are perhaps aware of the CMS blog. Oh, I was going to paste it into chat, but I don't think I have access to the chat while I'm sharing the screen. So I'll, uh, oh no, I do. Okay. Here's a blog post, but I've sort of um, reworked it to focus on like the connection between um, X-ray and Dask, really, and and how you know when you start doing X-ray stuff, um, how yeah. you can like, how that interacts with Dask as it goes. I have so, to interrupt, Dale. Yeah, it might be a good idea to increase the font size uh, by a little oh, okay. bit, if possible. How's that? Uh, that's, I think that's better. Anyone else has? Can can everyone see it clearly? Maybe a couple more times would be good, yeah. please, Dale. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's yeah. All right, cool. Uh, there's some rather large graphics in this, so we'll see how they show up. How they show up. Okay. This is a this also live demo. Video, so, you know? yeah, a live demo. Okay. So anything can go wrong. Um, so I'm kind of trying to follow on from of what Ramsey spoke about last week, and sort of these underlying uh, tools you can use to query um, what Dask is uh, what Dask is doing under the hood. Um, for the sake of being able to repeat this, I'm running this on a large ARE session. So that's half of a node in the normal queue. Um, it's not strictly necessary. It's just for there's a thing at the very bottom, the, the final step just needs a bit of extra memory. Um, so, you know, usual start, right? Launch a Dask client. And these are my preferred, um, my preferred, uh, Arguments for the Dask client, um, the Dask cluster. Uh, we found uh, time and time again that limiting the number of threads per Dask worker to one gives best performance. And this memory limit equals zero uh, just turns off all memory limiting on the Dask workers, which comes in handy if you've got uh, sort of uh, unbalanced work where one worker may need a lot of memory. It just prevents Dask from killing it. And so we can bring up the dashboard. We get a nice view of the dashboard. I like this one. And now, before we start, okay, we've got a Dask cluster. We want to do something with X-Array. Uh, it's important to note that not every um, X-Array function is innately aware of Dask. Um, for instance, open MF data set does need to be told that the Dask cluster exists with this parallel equals true flag. Uh, and there are certain other things like that. There's um, apply ufunk, for instance, I think, but that has to, that needs the argument Dask equals true to know that there is a Dask cluster. There are numerous ways for these non-native sort of Dask these non these non-Dask X-ray functions to discover your Dask cluster. And so you know we're looking at era five wins. Um, just open up the data set. You see the uh, Dask cluster wake up doing its thing. And we're going to do something resembling science. So we've got to, we'll create a time series here. We've got 279 points. We'll look at the uh, vertical winds at the 850 hectopascal pressure levels uh, over Melbourne. So that gives us this data array object. It's a time series. It's a single dimension, 279 points. And it turns out that the reason that this is, the reason that Dask knows what it's the X-ray knows what it's doing with Dask is that the dot data object here is a Dask array. And it's doing it's has all of the same properties that um Ramsey spoke about last week, where the data is not in memory yet. It's waiting, it's sort of queuing up operations to see um until it has 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 to actually deliver us data, basically. And Ramsey showed us uh, Visualize last week, which I didn't know about before then, which is pretty neat. But this gives us an idea of what Dask is actually going to do. So um, each of these bottom ones, bottom boxes is a file or a chunk within a file. And the top one is an output chunk. So we've got, uh, we can see, oh, we can't see in this one. No, we can see in this one that each chunk is a single value. And we notice that there are no arrows crossing each other. There are no sort of crossed arrows or no interaction, which means all of this can be run in parallel, which is kind of what you want out of Dask. You get the best parallelism when everything is, when nothing has to talk to each other. And so once we do plot, now, before I continue, this is 
because because we're using Dask sort of it's Dask arrays underneath. Uh, you can be lulled into a false sense of security because um, you might you won't you'll be working through a notebook book. You'll be sort of getting your data in a point where you're ready to save it or visualize it or something, and then you hit that final cell where you save the file or you plot the data, and your notebook grinds to a halt. And that's because it's doing all the computation in that final cell. It hasn't done any previously. It's just saving it for that last bit. And so we do that now, and we wake up the Dask cluster again, and we get some, we get uh, this plot of vertical winds, which is yeah, more or less useless. I get that. But uh, it, it resembles science. So anyway, let, let's try something a bit bigger. Um, so I'm going to start this cell now and then talk about it because um, that cell takes about a minute and a half to run. And given this is a live demo, that's give or take an eternity. Um, so this is based on Oz2200 uh, model output uh, converted directly from UM data to NetCDF. So if you're not aware of Oz2200, this is our flagship regional model. It's a 2.2 kilometer atmosphere model over all of Australia and then some. So you, the fields, the, a single level field is 2600 by 2120 data points and there are 70 vertical levels and the data is not particularly well formatted. So uh, a single hourly file that's about eight gigabytes of compressed at CDF will have, um, yeah. So if you're con sort of constructing time series out of that, you wind up reading over terabytes of, of files. So in this example, we're going to look at um, just do just surface temperature, same point, surface temperature of Melbourne over a two-week two week model run uh, at 10-minute intervals. And so we've got hourly files. It's 336 files to read in total. Each of these files contains 39 different variables that are on two different grid projections, that are on two different time scales, that have pseudo-level coordinates. It's a mess. And I just want to point out like the um, open MF data set arguments here. This took me like a solid half a day to figure out, like just going back and forth and seeing if I could get a plot at the end. Um, I, I tried it without this. Um, you can see here, I tried it on the Sapphire Rapid node, which have nearly half a terabyte of RAM and just trying to get a single time series plot was being killed due to running out of memory, which is just crazy. Okay, so we've got this ugly looking data set with its multiple projections, multiple time axes and all of that. And what we want to do is, well, OK, let's have a look at what Dask wants to do underneath. So doing the same, sort of the same thing as before, picking out a particular field, picking out um, uh, the latitude and the longitude, and just seeing how uh, what's going to be passed to the Dask cluster. Um, this takes four minutes, so I'm not actually going to do it. Instead, I'm just going to display one that we made earlier. There's sort of a preview here. Um, because of the sort of ugliness of this data, it turns out to be a much more complicated operation to generate this time series, even though there aren't that many more files. Uh, the end result is that, um, yeah, 10,080 open data set operations need to happen. And this is sort of hidden from you by X-Array. You, you wouldn't know this until you start running and it all just grinds to a halt because it's awful. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on here, and it seems to be like discarding most of the results. Um, yeah. So there's let's let's so again going back to the ideas presented in the the blog that I've linked to, we can try the um, preprocess function. So this is a function that will be run by X-Array for each um, file that it actually opens. And what we're making it do is just pick out the field that we're interested in right at the start. So um, yeah, this, this takes about another minute or so to run. So um, does anyone have any questions at this point? No, cool. OK, um, we will just. Wait for it to finish. Then I guess. Um, well, hmm. we're waiting. Then I, I just have a comment. Um, yeah. Um, that is one of the reasons that's so ugly. So just a warning to never do that is because yep. these files have a lot of different time axes, and yep. so actually, if you weren't doing that pre-processing, you will end up with variable which have been broadcast over 
extra time maxis and things like that. Yeah. You don't need to be. Um, so it's just like it's kind of unrelated to the issue, but while we we see what kind of ugliness. Yeah. I, and that's cool. what I'm, I'm sorry. To be aware. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to get across. Is that like you you might take some naive approach, take some sensible looking approach, and because of some weird property of the file, it gives you this really gross output that's going to take ages. And so you know we've got this that uh, command is finished up. We do the same thing with the pre-processed data, and when we visualize that, it looks a whole come on, looks a whole lot more sensible. It looks a lot oh come on. Live, live demos, they're the best. It looks a lot more sensible. It looks a lot like um, what we saw with the era five data. Every, a whole lot of embarrassingly parallel operations that creates, you know, we can use to get our plot pretty quickly. And there we go. We've got an average, we've got a temperature plot over Melbourne now. Hmm. So, um, just uh, as another, just following on from the blog, we've just got another case here where we were using pre-process to um, deal with some inconsistencies in two different in two different data sets that represent the same simulation. So we've got like we'll have some nice, nicely pre-processed one that's you know erified. It's pre-processed in the same way that uh, era five post-process. Sorry, in the same way that era five has been. It's got nice. It's got to single variables per file in nice daily output files. Uh, whereas the other half of the data set is going to be like what we saw above these awful, awful files. So we've got uh, two lists of files and we're using a pre, and, um, actually disregard that. Um, and so what we're doing is using this combined pre-process function to, um, if the data is raw, which we're picking by uh, whether it has this field or not, we grab that field, we drop some drop some variables and rename it. And otherwise we just use the, um, we just return the field that we're interested in. And so when we run this, again, the task cluster wakes up because we're using parallel equals true. And we wind up with, uh, we wind up with something that looks like a uniform data set. Oh, what have I done? I've reset the size. Oh, sorry, sorry. We wind up with, oh my God. This is going poorly. I apologize. Yeah, sorry, my, my zooming is delayed by a few seconds, so I'm not sure if it looks, if it's worked or not. My zooming is delayed by a solid 10 to 15 seconds at this point, and oh, there we go. But what we can do, again, we'll do the same thing, pull out the, um, you know, pull out the temperature over Melbourne and we'll have a look at the graph that it comes up with. And there's this nice um, subtlety that shows up when you switch from one data set to the other. And so we can see that um, you've got this large, we've got uh, six time steps per output chunk, so one hour. And so these, the first data set is daily data. So you've got 24 of these chunks coming from one file for the first seven days. Then you go halfway through and it switches across to each chunk coming from an individual file. That's That delineates where the data set has changed. And it's nice that you can see that using uh, using Dask. And so I'm gonna use the persist function here. Um, I'm gonna call it straight from the Dask array data object, but you can call it from the X array data array. It does the same thing. I just wanted to sort of keep it consistent with the Dask. Uh, presentation last week. Um, so again, we wake up the dust cluster, it does its thing. Um, the nice thing about using persist is this runs in the background. So if you've got quite a complex calculation to do, not like that one, which took a couple of seconds, uh, if you've got quite a complex calculation, you can sort of, you can call persist, you can do some more work, work um, prepare something else, and you can come back to it. And it will only block um, if you ask for a numerical result and that result's not ready yet. And so um, 
we can, this is what we've got the plot and the, the dot plot, and the dot values thing. This is, this forces it essentially to calculate values. And so we can have it generate all of these things quite quickly uh, because it's, it's saved that in that initial time series and it's just doing the final bit of compute at the end each time. Um, it's nice. It's kind of like a checkpoint, really. You save you save your state at a at a at a uh, sensible place, and then you can sort of come back to it, and it just speeds things speeds things up a bit. And um, the one last thing to note is that uh, persist only works exactly on what you've told it to. If you change the data array, even if it all comes from the same files and everything, um, it has to redo the whole thing. So you know, I'm calculating mean across the whole field now, and that's going to take a while. So yeah. Um, X-Ray knows about Dask because it's built off of Dask. All of, it, all of its objects are Dask. Its, its arrays are Dask arrays underneath. And you can interact with those Dask arrays directly um, using the data object. Normally, X-Ray is pretty good at handling when, um, when things should be computed, when things should be brought into memory, when they should stay on disk, that kind of thing. But sometimes there's, there's benefit to be had from directly going into Dask. And, and manipulating what it's going to do. Yeah, that's everything from me. <laughs>